Neil, I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, for everyone in the audience, I'm sitting here with Neil Reimer. He is one of the original founders of Index Ventures, a company that you started over 25 years ago and that has since transformed the trajectories of multiple well-known and loved global brands. For example, Roblox, Supercell, Discord, Slack, Skype, Farfetch, Datadog, and so many others. Neil, um, you are one of the most celebrated investors in the world. And you were also informally referred to as the godfather of venture capital in Europe. And it is a true honor for me to be here with you today. Thank you, Mina. So today we're going to be speaking about something very specific. Um, and it's something you know a lot about. Um, the topic we're going to be talking about is the personal characteristics of the world's most successful founders. And you're an expert on this topic because you've met with so many founders and worked with them closely throughout your career. So um, to kick things off, I'd like to ask you, how many founders do you think you've had a chance to meet with, um, either in pitch meetings or in other contexts during your career? So I've thought about this a few times, and I think um, it's in the thousands for sure. If you assume one per day for 25 years, it's probably over 10,000. 10,000 is a huge number, um, and it's really astonishing, really. And I think I can only imagine that through this type of exposure, you've developed a lot of um, pattern recognition as to what types of investors um, you are willing to back. For sure. Um, I guess it was uh, Malcolm Gladwell who said 10,000 hours, and you know those meetings are roughly an hour. So you definitely get to get some muscle memory and pattern recognition, and um, and it, and it, you know it's also been one of the great pleasures of my life and my career to be able to spend that much time with entrepreneurs. Um, so many, you know, inspiring, uh, just incredibly uh, uh, compelling people you want to spend time with. Um, you know, I think the, 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 the greatest thing about it is in this business, you can show up in the office in the morning and be completely unaware of some opportunity. And then you have this meeting and at the end of the day, you go home and it's the only thing you can think about. Um, that's, uh, that's truly special. So you and I, we both live in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, before, um, before coming over here to Finland, we had a chance to get together. And uh, as we were meeting, you articulated that in your mind, there are three distinct personal characteristics that set apart the best, the very best founders that you've ever worked with. So let's start unpacking that statement a little bit. The first characteristic that you said you look for is that you look for founders who are truly, genuinely passionate about the mission of their company. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and um, also about how you test for that in a pitch meeting? Yeah, so, you know, um, we're looking for people who have a deep, insight into a, mar into a problem that could give rise to a big market opportunity. And that has to come from some, you know, almost physical uh, uh, concern for this problem. Uh, you know, sometimes you get a sense that somebody's come in with an idea that was one of five completely different ideas, and they sort of weighed them up and decided to go with this one but they're not really that committed to it. And that's, that's uh, 
from my perspective, that's much less appealing. Um, we want to be able to ask somebody, you know, of all the things you could be doing in the world, why are you doing this? And um, how is it being done today? Why are you going to, you know, change the way that's done and, and win? But that needs to be coming from a very deep place. It can't be rehearsed. It can't be uh, uh, choreographed. That makes sense. I think it's often something truly palpable. They're living and breathing the mission of the company. Absolutely. Um, can you give us an example of a time when you met with a founder whose personal engagement was so strong, so evident, that you decided to back them even when there were perhaps some flaws in the business model? Yeah, I mean, this happens all the time because as early stage investors, you know, nothing is ever completely done, right? Uh, so very often, you know, there's this idea, uh, the marketplace is, the market is an interesting one. They have a unique insight, but there's no product yet. There's no revenues. Uh, you know, it's too early to really think about go to market. But they have a very strong belief in, uh, in what, what problem they want to solve. Um, one that comes to mind is, you know, when, when Dylan and Evan came to uh, talk to us about Figma, um, you know, they had a fairly loose definition of what they wanted to do. It was basically they, they were convinced that they could use this powerful new WebGL technology to build what they called Photoshop in the browser. Um, but we knew that that was kind of shorthand for an area they wanted to go into. We knew that probably at the end of the road, the product would be something quite distinct from Photoshop. But their, uh, their vision and their um, commitment to this idea was so strong and so compelling that we absolutely, and we knew that this was going to be a big market space, no matter how they decided to, you know, to redirect their efforts away from the original uh, definition, product definition. And we also knew that they'd be able to com communicate that enthusiasm to other amazing talent and build an amazing team and raise the money needed. You know, and today Figma is really focused on, um, on interface design uh, and is, you know, off to the races. But they started in a fairly different place. Does it also happen sometimes that maybe you're in a pitch meeting and everything checks out? Everything, the, all the numbers and all the data look solid. <clears throat> but there's just something in the presentation where you feel like the founder's heart not, not quite in it and uh, that it's led you to pass. Yeah, also often. Um, you know, things that might look good on paper, um, but when you meet the team, you realize that... Um, they, you know, they came up with a matrix and kind of had four different ideas and five different geographies and they, um, they kind of selected something. Um, they're expert at presenting it, but you don't feel this visceral passion for the problem or empathy for the customer. And you also might recognize that they, they're not really driven to see some change in, in the world because of what they're doing. Um, you know, they want to have financial success. They want the business to be worth, you know, X amount. But then when that happens, they'll probably look to exit and then go start something else. They're not as, you know, they're not kind of defining their existence by this mission. That makes sense. And actually, um, I heard another talk that was held on this stage earlier today where somebody was talking about um, the fact that you, sometimes, sometimes a pitch can come across almost like a management consultant talking about it. It's not coming from the heart. And that for her too was a red flag. So the next question I have to ask you, because um, uh, I was actually born and raised here in Finland. I grew up here in the 70s and early 80s. And when I was growing up here, um, I definitely, there's a kind of a cultural aversion toward people who wore their heart on their sleeve or who expressed enthusiasm too, aver you know, too overtly about anything. 
Um, and definitely, I remember many times growing up here when I was maybe too enthusiastic about something, and, and um, that was just not a good thing. So given, given, uh, given all your investments here in the Nordics, have you found any cultural differences in how that passion by the founder uh, expresses itself? I mean, first of all, um, you know, we started Index in Europe knowing that we would have to hunt far and wide for great companies to compete with Silicon Valley. And part of that was understanding and, and embracing the differences in culture. So, um, and we have, we built a team that, you know, is, is aware of that, is diverse and, and, and can do that. Um, I think what you're describing was probably more the case 10 years ago than it is today. I feel like um, the difference between entrepreneurs is, is narrowing in terms of how they express themselves, what's acceptable. But I do think that a country like Finland has a, you know, kind of a strong um, appreciation for the value of facts and numbers and logic. Um, and no amount of snazzy presentation skills can outweigh the fact that you may not have a great business plan or, or, or product idea. And I, and I agree with that. I think that's an advantage. But it doesn't um, remove the requirement of any founder, fin, Finnish or other, to be able to communicate the enthusiasm that they have for, for the mission and for what they're building. And when I think about you know, Ilka, who, um, you know, who we backed for, with Supercell, his enthusiasm for gameplay, which is the cornerstone of, of Supercell, was, was infectious. Mm -hmm. So I'm there, glad there was to no, hear. He, was yeah. not, he was not challenged in that way. You, you, felt, you felt it. You were able to feel it. Wonderful. For sure. So then, so then in our conversation we had before flying over here to Finland, we also talked about a second trait that you always look for uh, when, you're, when you're evaluating a founder. And that trait um, you described as a sort of a dogged determination, those were the words you used, um, like a willpower to, to do whatever it takes to remove whatever obstacle um, in order to execute on the, the mission of the company. Can you tell us a little bit more about this trait and how you go about um, sort of assessing whether it exists uh, in a pitch meeting? It's, it's probably the most um, often uh, referred to characteristic of a founder, right? That they need to be uh, completely determined and focused on this mission. And uh, I always tell young young founders who may be thinking about starting a business, even if I don't think it's a particularly good idea, that they shouldn't let me or anybody else talk them out of their idea. Because it's impossible to prove that something cannot be done. Uh, you know, you can try to do it, it may or may not work. But it's very hard to, to basically prove that something is, is, you know, will not work without trying it. So I always encourage them to just ask themselves if they really want to do it. And this takes an enormous amount of self-belief because you're going to face a lot of skepticism and uh, a lot of pressure to conform and not do this wacky thing that you're doing. I mean, frankly, if I had listened to people, we never would have started a venture capital firm in Geneva in 1996. That was lunacy. Um, but you want people who have this determination who are not stubborn in the sense that they don't listen to things that are, are, are being asked of them, that they're actually answering the hard questions, that they're not avoiding them, but that they are using those questions to reinforce their commitment to this idea. So yeah, we look for that. That's great. And as somebody who, who um, like myself, you know, has really worked with um, a lot of the, these types of very successful founders, um, I feel like it's a trait that is sort of infectious. If a founder has this trait, uh, they're able to 
almost wordlessly transmit it to everybody else in their team, everybody in the organization. Have you found that as well? Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, I wish I had your track record in choosing companies to work with because you've, you've been um, really astute in choosing great leaders and great companies. And I think you're right. I think the mark of a great uh, company in many cases is this almost, you know, it's in the water. You know, the, the founder um, believes this so strongly that they don't have to put on any kind of a show or sell anything to anybody. They're just being themselves and communicating this uh, every day to the company. And then if you talk to anybody in the company, at any level of the company, in any office or in any market, they're actually telling you something that's coherent and consistent with what the, the founder or the leaders of the company are saying. And a lot of that is articulating a vision. The other is just creating a culture that um, elevates the right kind of values, you know, clarity of thought, commitment, performance, honesty, accountability, empathy for the customer. Mm -hmm. And those things are reinforced every day in the way, in the way they live their lives and the way they, they, they work at the company. I know just what you mean. It's almost like a cellular change that happens, but that's originated by the head of the company. Yeah. So, um, as you think about the companies you've worked with, is there one company in specific that embodies this spirit of determination particularly well, and where that spirit of determination has allowed them to achieve things that maybe nobody would have thought would be possible? I have to say Roblox, uh, is, and you know that company well, and I was here a few years ago with David on this stage. Uh, when you think that that company um, started on a path to build you know, their version of the metaverse 12 years ago, and they basically started with what looked like stick figures on a screen. Uh, you got, you've got to imagine the amount of, 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 of vision, of leadership, of humility, um, discipline that that took. And all of those things really were embodied by, by Dave in the way he, he led the company to this point, the way he continues to lead the company. And in hindsight, you look at 12 years and you think, wow, they went really fast. I agree fully. Um, the third attribute that we talked about um, is perhaps a little bit contrary to the second attribute. And um, it is basically a willingness to go out and seek feedback, seek advice from external sources. Um, and integrate that feedback. You know, even, even when actually things might be going well, and maybe especially when things are going well. Um, and even when you're, you're super busy just executing on the mission of the company. Um, can you tell us what you've seen um, and what your advice is regarding this specific trait? This one is a little less intuitive, I think, um, at least to my mind. Because you don't often find people who are, you know, who have the kind of self-belief and drive to focus on this, you know, on, on knocking down obstacles uh, and being almost stubborn in their commitment to this mission, who are also at times willing to stop and say, wait a minute, this is really important. I, if I get this wrong, it's going to set, set us back for a year or, or longer. Um, I really need to stop and get advice from a bunch of people I trust and think this over. And that's what they do. They, they kind of switch off their, their kind of stubborn, bullheaded mode and then they go and on a walkabout and talk to people and get this information and they process it. And then they come up with a decision. They don't get bogged down in analysis. And they communicate that to the team, and then they go back into beast mode, you know, just, just flying forward on this, you know, with this new decision. 
And that's pretty rare. I don't, you don't see that in a lot of people, but I think when I've seen that in some of the, the best entrepreneurs I've worked with. And um, it kind of dovetails with the idea that, you know, you can be confident about an idea, but still willing to be vulnerable and recognize when you don't know everything. Uh, and that's something, again, we look for in, in meetings, even early meetings with entrepreneurs, because we want to see that people know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, not to everything. You know, they have to know certain things cold. Um, but some things, and, and not because they've never thought about it either. That's not a good answer. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's something important, uh, but they don't have to decide on it yet. And they know they're going to need help in getting there. And they know what they know, and they know wh what answers they need to still get, what data they need. And I find that very compelling. You've, you've, um, one of the things that you've written about uh, on a related note here is this whole idea of a playbook and how a playbook can be a bit of a misleading word because as soon as there's a book, you know, a book or a formula, it's something that's codified, something that we may be reluctant to change, to evolve over time. Can you tell us about a time when maybe you've worked with a team uh, and everything was going great, but they failed to, to be looking for that external feedback in order to evolve the play? Yeah, I, I can think of a few examples. Usually th this happens with companies that um, are consumer businesses, so when they take off, they take off quickly and they have complex models, sometimes like a three-sided three marketplace, um, like a Deliveroo, for instance. And what happens is they get early success because they launch with the right product in, in a good market, in, in maybe, maybe an ideal market, and they get early success that kind of validates what they're doing. And then they say, okay, Let's, let's distill this into a formula and then just look for other markets that look like this market. And they go and they find markets and they launch in those because they, they match the characteristics of their original uh, formula, but they pass over markets that don't specifically fit. And um, they're quite convinced that those markets won't work until they see somebody else making it work in those markets, who actually looked at their model and tweaked a few parameters and figured out a way of making it work. And of course, then they go back and tear down their model again and, and turn a few constants into variables and they find a way of making it work. And, you know, Volt is a good example of that, making, making that model work in, in smaller cities like Helsinki. Yeah, Volt and also Bolt is another good example, yeah. I think, because it's yeah. basically people who have adapted somebody else's playbook in order to take advantage of a slightly different situation, exactly. slightly different market conditions. Exactly. I think you need to think about these, these early successes as promising but not kind of definitive uh, in terms of, you know, the only thing that will work. So, Neil, we've talked about the three attributes that you look for in successful founders. So, you've, we've talked about um, sort of a, a genuine passion for the mission. We've talked about a strong sense of determination and we've talked about a willingness to go out and seek and integrate feedback. But you're also a founder. Uh, you're one of the world's most successful founders. And I'm wondering how you've been able to evolve um, to embody these three attributes and who and what helped you along the way? Uh, I mean, I, I feel silly sitting up here listening to these, these uh, accolades because really, you know, you can't build anything of significance without a team. And I had co-founders uh, and had and still have great partners. And... Uh, and partners in life, you know, who help you uh, kind of figure out what you're good at. Um, 
figure out what your what your your blind spots are. And you know, my partners, I knew I tried to choose partners who were really compatible, but not identical. You know, you want partners who are going to not disagree with you over the core things like values um, and uh, uh, kind of core principles, but challenge everything else, including the way you do everything else. Uh, and I think that's been something that's, that's really, really, really helped us along the way. Um, has, there, has there been a specific time when you realized that you needed to change? Has there been any specific moment that you, you're willing to talk about or you can talk about where you've decided, all right, that's enough, like, let's throw out the playbook and let's do something totally differently from how we've done it before? Yeah, like every day. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that the thing about our business that's amazing is that uh, you know, you, we get to invest in lots of companies over a long period of time in parallel. And every one of those companies is a learning, is a compound learning experience. You learn from the entrepreneurs, you learn from the great people on their team, their experience in the market, but you also learn as an investor what worked and what didn't work. And you learn from your partner's investments. So it's a very, very uh, rich learning experience. And you know, 25 years into it, I'm still learning very humbling experiences, but it's, it's very rewarding. Um, you know, what's important, I think, is to not hold on to the failures too long and to realize that it's okay, we're human, as long as you integrate it and look forward, um, you know, you can make, you, you, can, you can do great things uh, afterwards. Um, and just remind yourself, for instance, in my case, or in our business, to really focus on what this could become if everything works. Uh, because lots of things will fail, but, um, and some, some things may succeed, but the things that really matter are the things that can really be uh, ubiquitous and have a huge impact if they work. So that's what, that's what I try to remind myself, not to be weighed down by the past to trust my instincts and to allow myself to dream the dream. On that note, thank you, Neil, so much for sharing of your insight and all the wisdom you've gathered over the last quarter century. Thank you very much, Mina.